Hi everybody, welcome once again to RDA Tech Q&A. You have questions, we have guesses. With me as always is uh, my producer, Mike Gearman. He is a uh, hello. Long and storied history doing tech IT kind of stuff. I myself, I'm Nash. I do RDA and I have a ridiculously long period of playing around with techie type stuff. We got questions we're going to answer for you tonight. If you have questions for us at Tech Q&A, uh, go ahead and send those along to requests at radio.air.com. We will endeavor to maybe fix things. To yes, Grady, I was getting to that. Uh-huh. See, this time I heard him. So yeah. Really I don't. What? I, I'm getting to it, okay? Jesus, cat. He is so... Yeah. Anyway. Um, so we'll get to your question soon, but first we're going to look at some, uh, stories from the news this week in tech. And I think, uh, let's start off with this one. Everyone has been viewing Google fiber as the great savior of American ISPs and, and broadband. Cause for so long we've had the cable duopoly monopoly, um, where in some areas you have a choice between one cable provider and one DSL provider, and that's all she wrote. Um, Google Fiber's big initiative is they are rolling out fiber optic internet service to as many places as they can uh, squeeze into those municipal laws that are there to keep the duopoly in place. And everyone regarded uh, Google Fiber as this is a fantastic thing. We're finally having competition. We're finally have something new who is not the evil Dark Lord Comcast. And unfortunately, this week, Google Fiber made a move toward the dark side. And you know what they say. Once you set foot on the path the dark side, forever will it dominate your destiny. Um, Google Fiber... Uh, is doing something that quite a few, in fact, pretty much every I ISP has done before them. And that is to remove the right of customers to seek redress in the civil court system and move that to a little system we like to call clusterfuckeromia, or the technical term, binding arbitration. Yes. Um... Now, if you're not familiar with this, and I'm going to remind people outside of America, this is completely legal. It's insane. It's, yes. it's, it's fucking antithetical to the idea of coming up with some sort of legal solution. But it is, again, a process that is completely legal. Yes. Uh, can I give a quick little bit of background? Go ahead. Okay, so... Uh, 1925 is when Congress passed the Federal Arbitration Act. It was an idea was, instead of taking everything to court, let's put things in front of an arbitration panel or an arbit ar a single arbitrator, mm -hmm. depending on whatever, and get it solved that way. And that that was a not not a bad idea. The problem is, the Supreme Court in the last couple decades has said you can put whatever the hell you want in your contract, saying you can go to arbitration now. Yeah. And, uh, more and more, and this is this is something that's happened with more and more companies. They bury this this into just their terms of service, which you have to comply with in order to actually use this. Now, in this case, I will point out: in order to use Comcast service, you do or or Google Fiber service, you do have to sign an actual contract. Correct. But if you don't sign, you can't negotiate this contract. It is an all or nothing. What happens is, if you have a problem with Google Fiber, or for that matter, Comcast, AT&T, if you have a problem with them, if they have withheld, uh, if their service did not live up to what they stated in the contract, if there's been a billing dispute, if there's is any sort of issue like that. That you can't obviously get resolved with customer service. Right. If you attempt to go through customer service and you get blocked, or any, any number of things. Or, for example, like happened, uh, was a year before last, last year, where uh, they started sending out 
bills to people instead of using their name. That, what was it? Mouthy bitch was what they replaced yeah, the customers. Like that. Yeah, that would normally go to a civil court. But because of your terms of service with Comcast, it goes to binding arbitration, which is a for-profit company set up to value, to evaluate disputes between customers of another for-profit company. And you know who pays for the binding arbitration? The people who you have a problem with. Yeah. And the best part about it is the lawyers, because it's usually lawyers who are the arbitrators, uh, yeah. who are in this often have a revolving door between the arbitration company. I worked for the arbitration company for a couple of years. Then I go work for a company I ruled in favor of for a few years. Then maybe I go back to the arbitration company. Then maybe I go back to another company. It's it's really, really uh, painful for the end consumer. Yeah. And part of a couple of the big problems with it is that the courts have ruled that the arbitration are binding and the court system can't be involved. So if you go to arbitration, you can't then go, well, no, I want to go to court instead. No, you can't. Too bad. And they've said this is true even when there's a clear legal error that should have resulted in a different uh, result for the arbitration. So if if the arbitrator does something that's illegal, you, you're you out of luck. Yeah. It's, and in, it's a shadow and, system. Yeah. And they've also said it's perfectly legal for them to bury... The statement, oh, yes, you must go to arbitration in that, you know, click to advance thing no one ever reads. Yeah, it's it, it, it's a problematic system for a lot of reasons, mainly because it completely removes major corporations from oversight in their consumer affairs. Which it, and it's completely legal to do. You never get you never see a courtroom. You never see a judge. You just see this arbitration panel, which was hired by the company you have a problem with. Maybe you wouldn't, you'd think maybe there'd be a little bit of a conflict of interest there, but no, no, it's completely legal to do. Google Fiber current customers, however, are in a shred, a tiny piece of luck. You have a little, little bit, little tiny, tiny chance here. To opt out. Right. This is the one Do ray. So. Yeah. One ray of sunshine that has come down to this. If you are currently a Google Fiber customer, you have 30 days, which is probably a few less since this story broke this week. You have a little under 30 days to opt out and say, no, I do not wish to have binding arbitration if we have a conflict. I reserve the right to go to civil court. That is, that's still going to be an option for you, but you have less than 30 days to contact. You should have been sent something. If not, give Google a call. Give your Google Fiber tech support or customer service number a call and say, I would like the option to opt out, please. And they should be able to walk you through how you do it at your Google Fiber account. Now, if you are a future customer of Google Fiber, you fucked. That's what I was looking for. I couldn't find anything in the initial article I read saying, well, if I get Google Fiber here a year from now, do I have 30 days to opt out of the arbitration? No, you don't. Oh. Going forward, every new Google Fiber... Oh, it's tomorrow? Shit, that's not going to make any good to anybody. What's tomorrow? The the deadline, which... No, no, it's not tomorrow. It's not tomorrow. The, it's not tomorrow. Um, the Hang on a second. I just saw the date. Okay, the terms were changed on June 9th, and you have 30 days... From June 9th. So, yeah, you have, so you have a little under till the end of this, a, a little over this, the, I think early into July to get yes. this sorted out. Do so as, if you're a Google Fiber or know someone on Google Fiber, do it as quickly as possible. If you're not, you're fucked. Just like every other, and this is a disappointing move from Google because, well, we were hoping they were going to be the great savior. You were the is, chosen one, Anakin. This is probably business monkeys and lawyers making this decision. Yeah, and it may it may they may get enough negative press about it that they change their mind again. Uh, yeah, I hope so. 
Heck. Get- I mean, because Comcast doesn't give a damn about negative press. Comcast doesn't give a damn about anything. They don't have to. They're accountable to nobody except the shareholders. That's it. Neither is Google, but Google seems to care more about mm. PR. Yeah, Google does actually give a shit about PR because, you know, they have to operate. That is that is kind of one of one of the weird places where consolidation works in consumers' favors. Because in this case, Google has to operate in other aspects of the economy. And in doing so, they have their name across everything. So if people think Google bad in one place, that's Google bad in a whole bunch of places, and that's bad for the bottom line. So maybe a consolidation, uh, overall, it's not a good thing, but in this one case, maybe it helps out a little bit. So yeah. Um, Moving along, we got uh, a little bit more here. Okay. We talk a lot on the show about two-factor authentication. Um, Yes. To reiterate, for those of you who don't know what we mean by two-factor authentication, it's when you have a login account for pretty much anything, when instead of just... Like World of Warcraft. Yeah. Instead of just using a password and username, you have a second method of authenticating your identity. Most of the time, by the definition of this, is a system that is isolated to just the end user and the the person you're trying to lo- the the account you're trying to log into. Most of the time, it's a token ring. Uh, a de- uh, Could be a little phone dongle thing, right? Or an app, a dedicated app on your phone. But. We've gotten a bit hazy on the two-factor authentication thing. And by this, I mean there are a lot of companies right now, um, Wells Fargo, Facebook, uh, Steam, quite a few different companies in different areas who have decided, hey, we've got a cheap way to do two-factor authentication. SMS text messages. Ah, yes. Where, and the way this works is you go to log in and it says, oh, I don't recognize where you're logging in from. Say you're at a new place, mm-hmm. uh, internet cafe, whatever. Let me send you a text message so I can give you your pet, your key, so you can your one-time key, so you can log in there. This is fine unless someone can intercept your text messages. And that happened to a very prominent activist for Black Lives Matter on Twitter this week. Um... DeRay McKeeson, uh, his his password was not the problem. What happened here was, and this was actually a little smart, but actually kind of a little low-tech at the same time. Here's how your cell phone works. Most of the time when you activate a cell phone on an account, you give them what's called an IMEI number. This is sort of like the cell phone serial number. It's specific to that phone. Yes. And, and when you give them that number, when you're in the store, they, they look at your phone and it's it's underneath the battery most of the time. Although I will point out on my Google Nexus, it was just a sticker on the back. But anyway... Most of the time, it's a number that's imprinted on a, uh, underneath the battery on your phone. If you can take the battery out or it's, it's somewhere else on the phone, unique to that phone. When you're in the store, the, normally when you're deciding to buy a new phone, the salesperson will just go, okay, we've got the IMEI here, and they take care of it. You never even know it. If you buy a phone online or secondhand and you contact your cell provider, they will ask you for the IMEI number. Uh, I believe... I think IMEI is universal at this point, but there there used to be other... Uh, ISAP was another one, I believe it was called. I don't remember. But it's, it's kind yeah. of a constant. Now, here's the tricky bit. With a little bit of social engineering and knowing a little bit of personal information, in Mr. McKeeson's uh, instance, it was... It, it, Point that way, Nash. It's over there. Okay. In Mr. McKeeson's instance, it was knowing his social, the last four digits of his social. 
which is all over the place, so you can find that fairly easily. You can get that out of somebody's trash. It's it's fucked up. Um, they call. That's why I shred everything. Do that, yeah. They called his cell phone provider, pretended to be him, gave them the last four of his social, and the IMEI of a whole new phone, which they had in their possession. And by doing this, and by activating his phone account on their new phone, they were, start, they were able to intercept his text messages. And as a result of doing that, they could use the two-factor authentication on Twitter. Oh, and it's an important note. When they changed that, he was no longer getting his text messages now. No, because it as when that happens, it takes your account away from your old phone. So he goes, oh, I've lost my password. Please provide it to me. Oh, sure, here you go. So they took control of his phone account with very, very simple social engineering. And then they were able to access his two-factor authentication. This is not two-factor authentication. This is an un in completely ins insecure, insecure way to swap sims around. Right. It's, it's, it's what the fucking fuck. This really wasn't a breakdown of two-factor authentication. It was a breakdown of Verizon's uh, verification of this is really the guy calling. I wouldn't even say that. I would say anything where an account, a second account tied to customer service, tied to other people is involved, where they can flip some buttons and switch it to someone else. That's not two-factor authentication. No, no, no. I was, I was saying his Verizon account didn't have two-factor authentication. No, no. They just go, yeah. They, they, so it's a breakdown. It's a failure in my, from my point of view of, of Verizon. They're the ones who screwed up. Uh, but it's it, well, I'm I'm my bigger issue is across the industry. This is considered secure. Yeah, no. And as it is right now, it, this does not serve as to. In fact, it's less secure because with two, all you need with two factor authentic with this system, you don't even need your password. You just use the two factor to reset the original password, and you own them. Yeah. Um, and apparently what he didn't have set up on his Verizon account was a PIN, a personal PIN, right. that he needed to provide for any changes. Um, which apparently every, the article says here, every uh, major provider has this option to have a personal PIN. I recommend it. It'll make it harder for people to change stuff. In general, though, I don't consider SMS a... Oh, no, no, I... I agree. It's not really. It's not really two factor. And, and I hate that the 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 industry that many people are like. This is a shortcut. It looks secure, so people will feel secure, so we look good. Yeah, and it's not like they don't have application programmers in house that could write them an app. Fuck's sake! Google did this. Google created Google Authenticator. It is an app. You have to get it off the App Store. You have to set it up with your Google account. And you can't put it on someone else's phone. It's tied to your phone. It's an app that uh, it, it is two-factor authentication. It gives you a special code each time. It's tied to, you can't just get onto someone else's phone and download it because then it'd be tied to their account, not yours. And you can't download it onto, their, onto a new uh, phone without authenticating it first. So you have to have, say someone wanted to spoof. You have to have the old phone and go, okay, I've authenticated. Now I can download to the new phone. Right. Here's the code. And, okay, I can now get rid of my old crap phone. Right. Wipe this thing. You can't spoof it. You have to move it manually yourself. It's fairly secure. And Google Authenticator has APIs and whatnot to let third parties make use of this for authentication purposes. And there are other applications that do this too. It's a much more secure system. I'll tell you, I, I had one of these apps when I was playing uh, Star Wars uh, Old Republic. I had one of these apps on my phone 
And I'll tell you, I forgot about it when I changed phones. It was a bitch and a half, which it should be. It was a bitch and a half to get that account set back up again. I had to go through a whole bunch of hoops because I forgot to, to transfer the authentication over. I wasn't mad. I was grumpy at myself about it, but I wasn't mad about them about it because it was actually a secure system. Yeah. SMS is not. SMS gives the illusion of security to companies like Twitter and Wells Fargo and Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm in Facebook. They use this because it's cheaper. There's no infrastructure they have to worry about. And it makes the customer feel secure without actually being secure. And that is such a big problem, especially as we get more and more connected online. I know I'm, I'm, rant, I'm ranting and rambling a bit, but that is, <laughs> so, it pisses me off because they're, these are companies that are giving people the illusion of security without providing actual security and it's going to bite someone in the ass and they're not going to know any better because they don't follow all this tech bullshit. And it's, it's just, it's infuriating. It's fucking infuriating from, from like, uh. anyway, <laughs> uh, I am infuriated. Anyway, we have one more story tonight, uh, for the, for our, uh, our tech stuff. E3 has come and gone, or is it still going on? You're closer. Is that crazy it is still going on? I think it concludes to... Might have already finished by now, yeah. Oh, fucking E3. E3 has come and gone. And there has been a big announcement on the side of both Microsoft and Sony. And that announcement is... Well, I, I say on the side of Microsoft and Sony, Sony has not officially announced it, but they've acknowledged it. So, oh yeah, it's it's finished. It finished on the sixteenth. Yeah. Um, the the two big things coming from Microsoft and Sony, at least in terms of hardware, is new consoles in the same generation. And a lot of people have questions about these. These there are not two, but three new consoles from two companies, and I wanted to talk a bit because a lot of people have been having questions about this. Should I or shouldn't I? I want to talk about this really briefly. Um, on Microsoft's side, Microsoft has announced they are releasing a new console, the Xbox One S. And you can guess what S stands for. Slim. Um... Yeah. That has a, two letters in common. <laughs> All right, let, let, let's break. The first one is the Xbox One Slim. And like the name says, it is a smaller version of the current Xbox. It does much of the same things, although it does have a couple of new features to it. One of them is uh, they're offering uh, one model in two terabytes, which is, I believe, the current limit before was one terabyte, so it's going to have more storage capacity. Um... It also contains a the 4K Ultra video output um, and a 4K Blu-ray player. Other, so, all right, that's that one. Let's put that one aside right now. Um, there are two more consoles coming next year. Officially announced is Microsoft Project Scorpio, which is going to be okay. a vastly upgraded version of the current Xbox. It's going to have, again, it's going to have the 4K video output. It's going to have the 4K Blu-ray player. I'm confused by something. What? Okay, so yeah, it says uh, um, the console will bring 4K Ultra HD video and high dynamic range and 4K Blu-ray support. Right. Then the next paragraph of this article says, with uh, this model, you don't get 4K gaming. I'm like, wait. Not gaming. I'm video. I'm getting there. I'm getting oh, okay. there. I'm okay, kidding. sorry, he said I was misunderstanding. I'm getting there. Xbox Scorpio will, supposedly, according to them, be able to do gaming at 4K 
and have again the larger uh, presumably a larger hard drive size um more storage capacity all the other features oh, yeah, you're gonna need that because 4k uh, gaming version of final Fan final fantasy characters hair is gonna take up a lot of space and also while not officially announced it has been acknowledged by sony they are creating what's called the playstation neo which is a playstation 4 but again it's going to have the 4k video and the 4k blu-ray and the 4k gaming are they going to get Keanu Reeves to uh, advertise the Neo? For they might. They fucking might. You never know. I, I you know, I don't Can think. I don't think I Keanu don't does the Neo Geo. So the Neo Geo. Uh, anyway, okay. might not be not might not be a name they want to have taken. It should have been called the PS Four K. It should have, shouldn't it? Okay, that's that's a good solid name. Now the question coming from a lot of people is. Should I get the Xbox One Slim? Should I get Scorpio? Or if you're a PlayStation user, should I get the PlayStation Neo? Or just stick with what I have now? In terms of the Xbox Slim, uh, if you already currently own an Xbox One and do not have a 4K television, don't worry about it. Don't. You, you have no reason to upgrade. Uh, uh, unless you're going, well, I've, I'm running out of space to put things, and this one I can turn on its side, and it's slimmer. Yeah. And you've got money to spare. Yeah, that 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 would be... That's your only reason. Literally the only reason. Because it's, it's priced uh, about the same as the current Xbox One. If you already have an Xbox One and don't have a 4K television, there's no reason whatsoever... If you do have a 4K television and you already have an Xbox One, my opinion, there's really no reason to get it. Here's how, it, how I'm looking at it. The Xbox One Slim, what we mentioned earlier, it does 4K video, but not 4K gaming. It will play back uh, Netflix. I think Netflix allows 4K over... It doesn't allow it on PC, but it will eventually... But Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, it'll let you play back 4K video to, you know, video, those apps to a 4K television and 4K Blu-ray to a 4K television. But it doesn't do anything for the gaming. It's all still in 1080p. Right. So if you still have a 1080p, if you don't have a 4K television yet, but even if you no. do have a 4K television. It, only if you have money to spare should you upgrade. Right. And if you have that much money to spare, uh, I can give you a, a, my, my email address <laughs> and we can arrange for you to send me the money. <laughs> gladly take it and pay off some of my credit cards or, or, or buy a 4K TV for myself. It's, it's the, the, or they can send it to you and you can buy Grady cat toys. Yeah, they'd probably love that. Um, yes, 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 Floofy, I hear you. Um, I said his name when he spoke. Yeah. In general, if you're an Xbox user and you already currently own an Xbox, I would skip the Slim and wait for Scorpio because the four, their vaunted and lauded 4K gaming won't be out until next year. Yeah. If you don't have an Xbox, I would Get a wait. Well, I would wait until next year. Honestly, in fact, I now. PlayStation, I'm not entirely certain. They haven't announced a whole bunch of official stuff yet. Although I will point out, just to give you some rough numbers here. The PlayStation Neo will, and when I say terra, oh, oh boy, I have to explain what a teraflop is. It's a very fast computer, people. That's yeah, very fast. Teraflops are a measurement of how many calculations... A computer. Floating point calculations. Floating point calculations. It's Sorry, I'm a computer engineer. Yeah. It's relevant to graphics processing in this. So far, the leaked specs on the PS4 Neo put it at 4.2. Hold on, hold on. PS4 or Xbox PS Neo? Neo. No, the, the PS Neo. Put it at 4.2. Okay. Teraflops. 
The Xbox Scorpio has been is the specs on that say six teraflops. These are supposed to do 4K gaming. I will point out the very fastest video card commercially available at this moment is the GeForce GTX 1080 from NVIDIA. Right. That one is capable of nine teraflops and is just barely able to do 4K in 60 frames per second. Just barely at nine teraflops. So if people are expecting wonderful PC style graphics with super resolution and all the bells and whistles turned on at six teraflops at six or 4.2 teraflops on Sony's side. So now Sony might be saying might have, you know, said, oh, 4.2 teraflops per card and there's multiple cards. And but I doubt that. Yeah, it's. I'm 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 still skeptical of the performance claims that both sides are making on this for 4K video gaming. Yeah, but they're also probably a year away from being released, so I suspect the specs might get upgraded along the way. In general, unless you absolutely positively have to have an Xbox right now and you don't own one, there is no market for the slim. No. There there is nobody. Unless it unless it comes with a coupon for the value of the Slim that you can use to buy a Scorpio. I don't... Microsoft completely shot themselves in the foot with this fucking announcement. I, I don't get it. I mean, unless they're... I don't unless either. They're going, we've stopped, unless they stop selling the regular one and go, the only thing available now is the Slim. So it's it's there for people who... Yeah, well, I think, break. I think they've stopped with the old one, or at least they will soon, and they've already lowered the price on the old one. In general, if you don't have an Xbox, wait till next year. Yeah. Because what they, they pretty much said, what we have right now is going to be obsolete. Uh, actually, I can think of one other reason to get an Xbox now. Why? You live in a cold climate and you don't have central heat. They don't overheat like they used to, man. No more uh, Red Ring of Death. That, that just means only... A small percentage of them catch on fire instead of a larger percentage. All right. Well, that that that's going to be the news for this week. Now it's time to look at the questions. Again, if you have some tech issues you'd like Mike or I to take a stab at, you can send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will do our best to try and answer them. And we've got some sad stories this week because our first two questions... Uh I, 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 I'm already feeling the, oh, I'm so sorry. I feel these, all right. Let, let's start with James's question. I was wondering if you could help with the current PC issue I'm having. Ever since I was hit by a power outage, my PC has had difficulty staying on after I log on. Whenever I log in, the screen will get all glitchy, flicker, and usually turn black. If not, the screen will freeze. If I'm lucky, it'll display a video scheduler error or another video related error before rebooting. Occasionally I can get it to boot up without crashing and browse the web or even uh, edit audio video. But when this happens, it says, quote, the NVIDIA display driver stopped and is recovered. The fans, my graphics card are noticeably louder than normal. I tried uninstalling and reinstalling the drivers for both the control panel and NVIDIA's websites, but neither seems to have helped much like to resolve this problem, but I'm not sure if it's a driver issue or if the power outage damaged the graphics card and needs to be replaced. This is in spite of being plugged into a surge protector. If it helps, here are my PC specs. Well, okay. uh, that's not going to help because James... Okay, the best case, in my opinion, hmm. is that your power supply was damaged and replacing that will solve everything because it's not providing the right power to the video card. That, However, that's something I didn't think about, yeah. That, in my experience, is a possibility, but not a spectacularly high probability possibility. Okay, Let, let's, let's break down the surge protector. Many people have these in their homes. These are devices that are essentially 
the modern day fuse. Yes. What a surge protector does is when a lightning strike or a glitch in the grid sends too much, or in some cases too little power to your uh, system, through your home, down the, down the pipe, when one of those things happens, uh, your everything that's connected to that circuit has the potential to be damaged. Because, well, there's raw electricity just going zoop a doo all through your fucking cables. The surge protector aims to be... You know, I don't know how many people here actually even remember fuses. If they even encounter... Uh, maybe in their car they still encounter them. A fuse is a very ancient piece of technology in terms of electronics. It's a little piece of metal that's made to burn the fuck up if it takes too much power. And when it does, it burns out and your device doesn't because the power, the, the connector connection between the power surge and your electronics is severed when that, that piece of metal burns up. Yeah, uh, it, they, they, don't, they don't always burn up from that. You, if you put too much of a load on the far end, it can burn that out too. Yeah. But same sort of deal. Yeah. Now. Surge protectors work in similar ways that they're supposed to burn out rather than uh, let certain things go through. The problem, and many people aren't aware of this, is that surge protectors effectively have a finite life. And most of the models of them have a little LED on them somewhere, if that, that says, basically will light up this, when it says, uh, I'm no longer really working as a surge protector, I'm just passing power through. Yeah, surge protectors... Unlike a fuse, which if a fuse busts, nothing, no power is getting through anymore. So you, you can't turn it back on. It stops working until you replace the fuse. But a surge protector is a little different. If it takes the hit, it will still keep providing power. It's designed to do that. It, but it can't take a hit again. It's sort of like a bulletproof vest, like Kevlar. And this is something people don't know. Once a bulletproof vest takes a bullet, it's useless to protect you from further bullets because that's how Kevlar works. It takes, it serves the impact and the fibers are all fucked up and you have to replace it. Most bulletproof vests only take one shot and then it's useless as a bulletproof vest. Same thing with surge protectors. They can take one shot and like a bulletproof vest, you know, after you get shot with a bulletproof vest, you can still wear it as a jaunty accessory if you so desire, but it's not saving your ass from bullets anymore. Surge protectors are the same way. And like I said, they have a little LED on them. They'll say, uh, not surge protecting anymore. Or some, you know, it'll have some verbiage on there. You, uh, this is... there's, a, there's a handful of models that when they've taken their hit and they're, they're done, uh, won't pass power anymore. But, but not all don't of them. like those. They don't buy those because they go... It broke. It's not good. Uh, no, your power wasn't good. It worked fine. What you what you need to do is after a lightning strike or even after a brownout or sometimes even a blackout, depending on what caused the blackout, you need to check your surge protectors. You need to look and see if that little LED has lit up and said, this is, th there is an indicator on it that says this surge protector is damaged, has taken a hit, and needs to be replaced. Most people don't do that. So yeah. after it takes one hit, you forget about it, and then another hit comes, and the the overage, the the overcharge just goes straight into your electronics, and you're fucked. Yeah. Now, in your case, it's probably your video card that's borked. There right. is. I I just the power supply is a possibility. Uh, and if you have a good uh, tech shop near you, you know, like a Fry's or a, a, one of the better Best Buy's, where you can go and you can you can get a power supply and go test it out and go, oh, the problem still happens. Uh, yeah, wrong model, take it back. And they'll, they'll I don't like I don't listen to like doing that, but it's you can. You can. Um, I, I and honestly, while they are more expensive, Best Buy, I'll say they do sell. Uh, you've been to Fry's, you have those near you. Um, Best Buy does sell a model called Thermaltake in the store. That's the manufacturer. Thermaltake are 
good models. If you have to get one in an emergency, I prefer Corsair or a couple of different ones. But if you're in a if you're in a hurry, you're in a pinch, you have to go to Best Buy to get a new power supply. Thermal take will take will do. They're solid. They're well made. Um, and if it turns out it is your video card, that video card's now old enough that it's a relatively inexpensive replacement. Yeah. What what model uh, does he have? Uh, Seven sixty. Seven sixty. Yeah. You'd be whatever you get now. It'd be a fucking upgrade. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, you can get the nine sixty, which is actually I believe a little cheaper now. They've announced some other stuff, and it'll be a good replacement. One last thing you can try, which might not work, but it's worth it because it's free. You can attempt to take the video card from one PCIe slot, that's the, the slot that the video card is seated in, and place it in another one. Because there is a chance the damage was not to the video card, but to your motherboard. It's, it's iffy, but it is a chance. Yeah, I'd certainly give that a try. Yeah, just take it out of one slot, move it down to another one, because most systems have multiple PCIe slots at this point. Not all of them, but most do. And you can move it. He gave us he gave us his motherboard. Yeah. So let's see if it has. Multiple. It should. An Asus? Oh yeah, Asus probably it's Um Actually that one look okay, yes, it does have two. Alright, so yeah, you have two PCIe slots. Move the video card from one slot to the other and see if it still gives you the errors. If it does, I, it's the it may be his power supply, and you may be right about that. But what's making me think it's the video card is that his fans are the fans on the video card itself are working yeah. overtime. That might mean there's been physical damage to the card and it's not processing power properly or it's trying to use too much or too little or there's some damage to it that's making it overheat and the fans are trying to compensate yeah but overall but i'm, I'm sorry james that's not the best answer for you but this is one of those physical damage things that software just isn't going to fix and everybody, just as a reminder to everybody, if you take a power surge, if you even a brownout, even when if your lights go and then come back up, it's still worth just doing a double check on your surge protectors because that can trip them, that can damage them, and they won't be good for anything but being, you know, place to plug extra stuff into. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'm reading online with uh, some other people who've had a similar issue is you might have a difference um, depending on how it's gone to sleep previously versus how it wakes up. If it goes to sleep naturally, it wakes up differently than if you tell it go to sleep. But since you're having it on normal boot up, I'm guessing that's not the issue. I'm very sorry. And here's another one we're going to have to say, I'm very sorry. God, I hate doing yeah. this. This is from Jane. She says, I have a Samsung Galaxy S4 I'm happy with it. Don't want to buy a newer phone at this time, but a couple weeks ago I dropped it, cracked the screen badly at the bottom. Had to get it repaired. It works fine, apart from a couple problems. While the physical home button at the bottom center still works, the back button and the one that shows all recent apps, which were like, par like part of the touchscreen, are literally gone. Or in the repair place, it would cost more than I wanted to pay to them to fix it when they replace the screen. On their recommendation, I downloaded an app, Back Button, to replace them. That's okay, except that pre-damaged, the button showed all recent apps, acted like a menu button in some apps, and the replacement one doesn't. Some apps don't, ha don't have a menu symbol I can touch without this button function. I can't access the menus. Can't access the menus. Do you know of any way I can restore it without rooting the phone? I say without rooting because this is the other problem post-damage, there's something wrong with the USB port. Phone randomly makes the sound like a charger's being plugged in or removed. The battery symbol often has the charging symbol even when there's nothing plugged in. The ability to charge the phone seems unaffected as does the battery life. It just has this weird thing of thinking there's a cable sometimes. The bad part is when I plug it into my computer, the phone starts charging, but nothing else happens on the device. They no longer detect each other. So unless there's some way to root the phone without plugging it into a computer, this solution is out. Really would like to get another year or so out of this phone. Um, 
but if I can, especially after paying for the screen repair, and everything else still works, but it's really annoying not being able to access menus or settings in some apps, any suggestions for this function would be much appreciated. Oh, Jane. Uh, yeah, I don't know of any apps off the top of my head um, because that is a sort of a core function of the phone. You know, it's mm -hmm. something built in. Uh, I don't know too many apps that handle that for you. I mean, I'm sure it sounds like there's a market for it of, hey, this button doesn't work anymore. Give me a software workaround. Yeah, you'd think. You'd be wrong, but you'd think. Jane, but what's really concerning me about this is the USB port. And that's something, if, if it's thinking it's plugged in when it's not, uh-oh. Uh, it, not being able to access the files on it, you could work around that. There's like drop, airdrops and whatnot. And uh, AirDroid is a nice, AirDroid's a nice app. It works for free. It allows you to um, connect your phone to your computer via your wireless network, which is a nice little feature. You can drag files back and forth and access stuff that way but the charging option has got me concerned on this not like super dangerous but the fact that it thinks it's charging when it's not that means there's a short somewhere and i do i never ever ever like people walking around using electronics with shorts and it's oh, yeah. not always dangerous but it can be because if there's a wire shorted particularly a wire that's telling the phone it's charging or is in any way connected to the power system of that phone that makes me nervous as hell um can she get her money back from the repair place probably not no because they they did fix the screen part uh, he, of the problem yeah they they just didn't know about the, the thing well no it's just it said they it said they did but it would cost too much to replace yeah, it that that's the problem with modern cell phones um it's when you have your cell phone let me bring mine out so i can show it to you here is your cell phone everything under this screen everything that is not the screen or the case is all one piece there are no multiple pieces in here there's a battery and there's a motherboard with everything on it. There, There's no separate pieces. There's no little part you can just snap in here to replace this little charging port. No, it's all one piece. So to replace that charging port essentially means to replace the phone's motherboard, which is essentially replacing the phone. Um, I would not feel comfortable using this phone, Jane. That's just my own over... I, I'm being, I may be overprotective on this. I would not feel comfortable because you mentioned the charging thing. Yeah, and I'm looking, trying to look up other apps here that might solve it, and the ones I'm finding are not filling me with even a lot of confidence. Either they don't seem to do the functionality that you need, or mm. they might, but they require so many permissions for so many things I'm looking at and going... Why do you need this? Other than, okay, yeah, okay, it's it's replacing buttons, so maybe that's why it does. Uh, but it, I always get concerned about apps that say, we need access to your Bluetooth. I'm going, you're not a Bluetooth app. Why, why do you need Bluetooth app? Walgreens, my Walgreens app just asked for Bluetooth access. I'm like, what the fuck no. does Walgreens need your Bluetooth for? That's wireless connection. Wal Walgreens' app should not be trying to talk to other shit. Yeah. Well, I don't even need the app anymore anyway, since I can't refill my prescriptions uh, via the app, and I have to go to a doctor every time now. That's that's just some sloppy coding right there. That, that That's well, no, badly... I, I, I'm sure they, they, they want some... They've added some functionality they think needs Bluetooth access, but they didn't tell me what it is. They don't say, we're adding this so you can do this thing. Well, I don't use any Bluetooth devices with my phone anyway, so... Anyway, Jane, short version is... I would, I would get, I would go ahead and replace it. I'm sorry yeah. that that. I will do a little bit of looking, a little bit further looking, see if I can find an app for you. Um, but I'm not, I'm not enthusiastic. 
Yeah, the, the, this this happens. This is just one of those problems with modern cell phones. They they're they're all integrated. They're all one piece. They're all one component. And if you replace it, you're replacing the whole phone anyway. And the 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 four is an older phone at this point. I would just get a Nexus myself, but that that's not an option. I know I know it's not just an option to go out and be like. Derp, herp do here's a new phone because these things are not cheap i'm i'm sorry i wish we had better answer but that's one of those hardware ones it's nasty but let's see what look where our time is i i think we, we've got okay we have two more questions um okay. let's do rogers first because it's quick uh roger wrote in and said yahoo is no longer doing true customer support that you can actually contact why do you suppose this has happened because they're cheap. Well, that and Yahoo is fixing to get rid of all their internet services. That too. They're they're looking for people to buy every scrap of internet service they have. And so far, uh, what I've heard is they haven't found a lot of takers. No, they haven't. That's not been going well. But they are. Look, uh, Yahoo's internet side, which includes things like Tumblr, um, is not making money. It's been a, a drag on the company. Now, Yahoo does have a profitable side. They made a big investment in another company. And that's been working out gangbusters. So what Yahoo wants to do is spin off the unprofitable internet stuff into another, to someone else buy all that from them. And Yahoo will just be a holding company for their shares in Alibaba. That's all they want to be. They just want to be a holding company for those more... What the hell? So, Roger, yeah, that's probably why you're not getting any cu customer service from Yahoo. They don't give a fuck anymore. It is, it's like the, the last days of Babylon over there right now. They're, they're probably just burning shit in, in garbage cans and dancing around howling to moon gods at their tech support service. Because they know they aren't going to have a job for much longer. <laughs> Sorry. All right, our, our last one comes from Martin. He, uh, hello, Martin. Hello, Martin. Uh, here's the issue. When I watch TV via coaxial cable, um, I, try, I watch TV via co coaxial cable. Due to the position of the wall socket, I require a 10-meter cable. Tried several ones. Signal quality is not sufficient for the UHD channels, uh, that be 4K, Black screen and check shows signal quality 94%. Everything else works fine. You would think 94% would be sufficient. Think. If I hang an inferior cable that's just six meters across the room, uh, UHD works. Signal quality 96, 97%, no artifacts. Do I need a signal amplifier or might a better cable do the trick? Uh, can I recommend one? He's from Europe. Not entirely sure of the setup. You guys call cable television. It's not sat or terrestrial, just cable. Um, P.S. Yeah, I know I should have waited to buy a 4K TV. Yeah, they're not mature yet. But, you bought it, you're here. Well, I have a hunch of what's going on. Uh, do you have anything, Mike, first? Uh, well, the signal amplifier is a possibility, certainly. Yeah. Um, if, because the 6 meter cable is working for you, that tells me... The cable resistance is just enough that there's, in 10 meters, that there's signal degradation. Or, or there's something in that last four meters of space that's going, I'm interfering with the signal. Well, he's tried multiple cables, but here's what I'm thinking. Quite often I'll tell people that when we're talking about digital television, a cable's a cable is a cable, except... See, when we're talking about cables like an HDMI cable, which is the device that, the, the cable that connects your television to your cable box or your Roku or your Apple TV or your PlayStation, the HDMI, it's, it's the ubiquitous cable that goes across everything. Everyone uses it for video. Those are pretty much a cable's a cable's a cable because there's no magic in the, you can't like silver plate them and gold plate them and super duper shiny. That's a waste of money. Uh, with coax, you might have to do impedance matching. There are two main... Yeah, with coax, it's different. With coaxial cable, signal strength 
matters and being able to transmit that signal at a better at better quality does in fact matter now right now in the consumer side of things well i'll mention there are three main types of coaxial cable and when we say coaxial cable we mean that little cable that's got that thin stick of copper popping out of it and then there's a screwy attachment to it you've also it's the one you have to plug into something and then screw it on. And normally it's been associated with cable television, cable internet. It's the one that comes out of your wall. There are three main types of consumer coaxial cable. There is RG59, which is better, which the older standard, RG6, and the one you're never going to see, RG11. RG11 normally is buried in the ground. If you've seen an RG11 cable, you either work for the cable company or you've done something incredibly stupid. That's not where your garden should go. You should call someone before you start digging next time. <laughs> um, RG59 and RG6 are the two classifications of what's indoor cable, the cable that you use to plug from the wall to your television set or from your the wall to your modem or from your television set to your dish TV or whatever. That's that that that's the kind that they use inside. RG59 is the older standard and it uses not such good com quality components, not such good. Listen to me all technical here. I speak real well English type thing. RG59... Just, just like Donald Trump in his Big League. Huge. Huge. Like um, he used Big League the other day. Big League, yeah. Huge. Big League, huge. It's um, a perfectly cromulent word. <laughs> the RG59 cable is not as well constructed. The RG6, yeah. on the other hand, is got a lot more copper in it. Copper is one of those important metals. It transmits things like electricity and signals much better than something like, say, aluminum or tin, which the RG59 had a bit more of those not transmitting metals, and the RG6 had better. What I'm getting at, Martin, is what I could recommend is making sure the cables you're using, the 10-foot cables, are RG6. RG6 is rated for transmission across 100 meters. There's, that's why they're built to a better specification. RG59 is not meant to run that long. Now, I know you're only doing 6 and 10 feet here, and it shouldn't matter, but you're obviously having a signal difficulty. So, I would check and make sure those... Ca and you can normally find written on the cable somewhere if it's RG6 or RG59. Not always, but you can and find And what it. you want, by the way, is... If you find it, you want 75 ohm cable. Mm. Because this is why I mentioned impedance matching a moment ago. Impedance matching is when you match the resistance of the components in the signal chain so that it doesn't, well, the short version electronically is doesn't screw with things. Yeah. Impedance matching means everything's working at the same level. Let's, let's think of it as levels. You have a level up here and a level here and a level down here. If the impedance are mismatched, well, let's say this level and this level, you're trying to move, it's kind of like trying to move uphill or move downhill. And it'll work. You'll get the shit where it needs to go. But it's taking more effort or it's taking less effort and things get, it, it throws things out of yeah. whack. If you were just doing uh, radio or, or, uh, uh, or sound transmission, 50 ohm would be fine. But video, you need 75 ohm. Uh, and, and as for brands, I don't I don't necessarily have a brand that I recommend. Not uh, Monster. Want, not Monster. Monster, uh, you, just you'll overpay on, that's all I'm going to say, you'll overpay on Monster, but continue. What I'm going to say, what you're looking for, though, is you're looking for something with a copper core mm -hmm. and a copper shield rather that, than aluminum, that. aluminum, or copper aluminum. That's RG6. Uh, well, RG6 can have co it can be aluminum, aluminum, yeah. can be copper. Yeah. yeah, it depends on because RG6 is just it, is is more or less the connector. It's, it's, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't doesn't really talk about the shielding. True, true. I mean, 
Technically, the guide does say, but no one follows. They're not <laughs> follow the guide. <laughs> ah, what the fuck ever. Put it out on the market. So yeah, look for well, copper it's, shielding, it's like copper the difference. I'm going gonna, gonna to speak about my job slightly here. It's like the difference between okay. mill standard and mill spec. If we say something needs to be a mill spec, then it has to follow the specification. But if we say something, if I go to a contractor and say it needs, needs to have this mill standard, they can ignore what I just said. <laughs> because mill standard is meaningless as far as contractual terms go. If I say mill spec, it has to meet the specification. Yeah, mill standard, it, wor it worked. How did you build it? It works, okay? The standard may have numbers and things, and they may have followed it. But it's just, it's screwy. It's, so yeah. look, you're looking for copper, copper, your copper core, copper shielding. Yeah. Um, you, you could get into details and say, you know, you want, um, hang on, let me find it here because I just had it. Uh, oh, never mind. Good, but yeah, you could have all sorts of, uh, here we go. Uh, uh, dense copper braid, double fo uh, foil shield, solid copper center. Nitrogen injected PE foam dielectric. There's lots of all sorts of things you could look for in there, but realistically, if it's a copper core and a copper shield, you're going to get yeah. better signal than you would with aluminum. Yeah, basically, because it works with one cable and not the other, I'm thinking that one cable you have is a better constructed quality than the others. Yeah, because four meters is not really a huge distance as far as video signal goes. No. I mean, unless you were, re realistically, unless you were right at the limit at your wall, and you go, okay. Yeah. But, but that's that's really st sort of statistically unlikely. I Yeah. Basi I, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't need a signal amplifier. I, I don't like recommending those because they're always kind of iffy anyway. Yeah. I they think can. I it's my instinct says just the cables you have, the 10-foot ones, are just meter. 10 meter. It's my bad. I'm American. American. Um... I, I just think the 10 meter ones, they aren't quite up to spec is the problem. So like, like Mike says, copper, copper core, copper shielding, RG6, 75 ohm. Look those specs up when you're getting a new cable and you should be okay. Yeah. And, and like, and like we say, not monster. Not. Because while their, their, their quality is decent, they, you're paying two to three times as much as you should. You're paying for the name. When it comes to Monster, you're paying for the name, and that's it. The and... same way people who buy Apple products do. Oh, we're going to get letters. Um... <laughs> uh, anyway, folks, that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. Thank you for joining us once again. As always, if you have more questions, send those to request at radiodeadair.com. Mike, thank you very much. And sure. we will see you back here next time. Okay.